and maybe when they find out that I am a regenerative sheep farmer, they expect to see a miniature version of Greg Judy's operation. unfold my day to day and try to be as transparent as possible with you on my management format and strategies. I hope it gives you some greater insight on why I don't, in my specific context, implement some of Greg Judy's practices. As I do, I honestly really hope it gives you a broader picture of this thing called regenerative farming and the reality that everybody is doing it in a different context. There are principles that cannot be forsaken in this particular thing called regenerative agriculture, but there are also principles that need to be adjusted based on where you're farming and what you are farming. So with all that into consideration, let's get to today's vlog. It is the Shepherd is at Harmony Farms and the sun is shining. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad. Um, so we are coming on the upswing of winter storm Uri in Texas. Sheep have been in the corral four days longer than I expected them to be. Um, we are gonna move them out as soon as possible just to get them onto some fresh ground because we're just constantly moving them to keep them off their parasites. That's been one of the main struggles with our flock overall. And probably if you're if you're running sheep or goats or whatever, you can relate. So, getting them into some fresh pasture, um, even if we're still feeding them the same ration, the same hay, just getting them onto fresh ground is going to be a huge priority for me, probably in the next 24 to 48 hours. Plus, the hoses are thawed, so thankfully the watering thing should be a lot, lot easier. Um, I want to say a huge shout out and thank you to Ralph, I think it is, sent me over a tutorial or sort of an idea on a solar powered boiler for keeping water thawed. Um, thankfully we are all thawed out, but I'm going to really be keeping that on the back of my mind for anything future. I'm going to show you how Winnie feels about the sun coming out. Just soaking it up. That's right, he's a, he's a regular old beach boy. So I do have to majorly say praise the Lord, we did not lose any livestock. We lost a couple of our chicks that we just got in. If you watched a couple of videos back, we did lose a couple of those. Um, but we, the sheep are doing great, the lambs made it, um, and everything is just looking really good coming out of this. Um, it wasn't without challenges, but it was a great, great um, learning curve and it just, I couldn't have asked for it to go better. So thank you guys, everyone, um, for all of your support and all of your comments. I just get such a thrill every time um, somebody leaves a comment on one of my videos or even gives it a thumbs up. So thank you guys for your support. It's been a joy to share this experience with you and really appreciate you joining this journey. What we're gonna do probably is deworm them tomorrow. We do still deworm conventionally. It's part of our management strategy. I know there's a lot of Greg Judy followers on here who, if you aren't familiar with Greg Judy, he advocates for no worming. And what you have to do if you wanna take that route is just be ready for a lot of death. Um, and from what I've asked around, that's just what happens. And if you wanna take that route from a management perspective and just not worm your flock and let them die, People do that, you know, some people do that. I'm not, I'm not there. And the reason being for that is that we live in a region where we receive above average rainfall, which means we're like at 47 inches. Another thing is that we don't get harsh winters, you know, except for what you just saw this week. So that creates this perfect cocktail for parasitic activity. 
and to be honest the breed of sheep that we're running are dorpers and they are more acclimated to an arid and dry climate so it's kind of a double whammy on there and for that reason we've got to adjust our management practices because of the type of sheep we're working with and the climate we're working in and our management and practices include chemical dewormers now I do have to say that the usage of these has been down just since we started rotational grazing. And I'm gonna be really excited to see what happens in the coming year. But until then, we are using conventional dewormers. It's just something that is related to the breed we're working with, the type and class of animal we're working with, and the region in which we are farming. It's extremely wet and extremely warm, which is a perfect climate for not only grazing animals, but parasites that may infect grazing animals. So it's a little bit of a gritty talk, but one that I wanna make sure to be honest with you guys and upfront about. We do still conventionally deworm our flock. It's part of our management practice, and you really need, if you're gonna think about sheep, get a good idea of what you're gonna be prepared for on that front. Um, you, like I said, there's a lot of followers of Greg Judy who does not deworm his flock, and it can be done. But it is what I'm realizing going to be for me particularly, if I ever come to that point, probably a work of years and adjusting my flock to a more suitable breed for this particular climate or moving to a better climate, which, you know, but that is where I am at and wanted to give you guys that little bit of a plug. If you want to go back on this channel, I created a video called Three Things You Need to Know Before Farming Sheep and it kind of wraps up what I'm glad that I knew this year when I assumed ownership of the flock. So check that video out. Good morning guys, I am out here getting some prep done. Uh, I'm still getting used to that early riser part of being a farmer. Uh, I'm more of a night owl, which doesn't matter so much when the sheep are on pasture, as long as I make sure they have their water and everything before bed. They just wake up in the morning and start eating grass, but when they're in confinement, they need food and such early, which I gotta give a big shout out to my dad, who is a relentless, 6.30 a.m. wake up person and he's been handling the watering and getting the sheep hay for me. So, thank you dad. Huge shout out to you. Um, we're gonna be worming today. So I'm gonna be selectively worming the flock using a, it's called a FAMACHA scoring process. You actually have to go through a specific educational course to be certified. We are not certified, we've just study the charts and that's how we know. What it is, is you check the eyelid of the animal and however pink it is or is not indicates however heavy the parasitic load in the animal is because you know a white eyelid indicates anemia which is a result of the parasites you know sucking all the blood out of the animal system. Um, so we're gonna be checking Anything that scores well on the FAMACHA chart will not be chemically wormed. Anything that does not score well will be wormed. So it's one of the ways we're kind of proactively working to only use the chemicals when we need them. And also it helps because the less you use the chemicals, the less your flock needs them. It's an odd, odd thing, but while we're kind of on a small scale, uh, we try to do that and make sure that we only worm what needs to be wormed, so. This may be the first and only snowman, at least the first and only five and a half foot tall snowman we'll make in Texas. So I just keep a simple spreadsheet on the U's. Um, this is something I carried over from my mom's management before I assumed ownership of the flock this year. And it kind of tells us when we worm, how we wormed, and how much we gave them, and then how much they actually needed it, how each, each U was looking. And this is gonna help me into the future if I ever cull for parasite weakness. It's gonna tell me which ones I ought to look to first. I'm not gonna do any of that culling until one year into my livestock management journey. I still wanna see if they continue to improve as they have with rotational grazing. So that, that's all gonna happen probably a year in to my, to my journey here. 
If you watch the first video, or if you watch the primary video on this channel, it's the Becoming a Farmer in 180 Days. And it'll kind of tell the story of the beef cattle that turned me into a shepherdess. So, to kind of recap that story, I wanted to get into beef cattle because I, I wanted nothing to do with sheep. But when I started to research and study how to raise beef cattle, and I got into the concept and principles of regenerative agriculture and the rotational grazing, the idea of, of doing that, I was like, I want to do this with my cows when they come. And then I realized when I was researching that and I was looking out my window at the sheep, which were really struggling, and I said, I could probably practice at least on the sheep. I mean, they're going to die anyways. And if I fail at this rotational grazing thing, you know, at least I won't have failed on something that cost me a lot of money. I know that sounds so horrible, but, but that's exactly what happened. And I began the rotational grazing with the sheep. And we coupled that with just the continuation of our parasite management strategy and, and the flock just came back to life. It was unbelievable. kind of led me to get more serious about sheep, seeing what rotational grazing did and, and the impact it made. It made me think, wow, I can really, I could probably do sheep. So this year I went to my parents and I said, I want to buy the flock. And that is how I became a shepherdess by pursuing an education in beef cattle. still have the beef cattle, but I am very excited about sheep farming regeneratively, and that's the long of it. What I've learned from this journey is that sheep need a shepherd or shepherdess. If you're going to do sheep large scale or really any scale, they need pretty much constant care of some sort or another. They are far more intensive management wise if you want them to thrive than any other animal I know. And, and that's why as I've undertaken the ownership of the flock, I've also undertaken the understanding that these sheep will require more of me than any other animal I probably could have chosen. And even for followers of Greg Judy, who, who really advocates for less of these certain management practices, like deworming and such, if you watch his videos, you'll realize he relentlessly moves his flock once a day, sometimes twice a day. So no matter who you are or what you're doing, and if I have to say it a million times on this channel, sheep need a shepherd or a shepherdess, and that's exactly what you're going to have to be ready for. Somebody commented the other day and was curious, why do you always say we? Why do you always say ours? The reality, guys, is there is no I in farmer. While at the end of the day, whatever happens with this farm business is kind of on my shoulders, uh, my family has made it incredibly clear that they are here to support me in whatever way I need. So they are my we and my our. Six 
60 degrees on the forecast for this weekend. I think this snow will be melted before we know it. Like I said, I'm already back in my hoodie. Life is back to Texas. Uh.